If the Father could be a consuming fire without losing his personality, so can the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. He's like a wind. He blows mysteriously. We don't know where he's going or where he's coming from. He's like water, which cleanses us from our sin. He's like fire, which burns up the impurities which are within us. That's why the Bible uses such language about the Holy Spirit. So he's a person. He has rationality. He has intelligence. He has will. He's also God. He's not just any kind of person. He is divine, holy, and completely divine. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says he is the eternal spirit. Psalm 139 speaks of him being an omnipresent spirit. And as God, with the Father and the Son, He is almighty and He is glorious, and is therefore with the Father and the Son to be worshipped as the one true God. That's why in the baptismal formula we have in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They have one name. That one name is God. That one name is Lord. That one name is Jehovah. They all share that one name. That's why in the apostolic blessing we have the three persons named again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. They are equivalent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is as powerful as as the love of God, which is as powerful and as mighty as the communion of the Holy Ghost. Those three things are equivalent in their value. When the minister prays those things upon the congregation, those three things are gifts of God himself. To state something which is blatantly obvious, but perhaps we often lose sight of, the Holy Spirit is holy. The Holy Spirit is holy. And not simply because He is opposed to all sin. The Father is opposed to all sin, and the Son is opposed to all sin. But the Holy Spirit is holy because He is the consecration or the devotion of the Father to the Son and the Son to the Father within the Trinity. That's what holy means. Devotion or consecration to God. And God's holiness is in the deepest possible sense His devotion to Himself as the one true and ever-blessed God. I is God devoted to himself through the Holy Spirit. He is the breath of God. The Spirit is breathed forth by the Father to the Son, and the Son then breathes forth the Holy Spirit to the Father, and in that way they are devoted to one another in love, enjoying one another, delighting in one another within the very being of God and having perfect fellowship together. He's the Holy Spirit. Notice the Bible never calls the third person of the Trinity the Happy Spirit or the Jolly Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And that's important. There are many today in the church world who say, I am a spirit-filled Christian. I am particularly spiritual. In fact, your church is not spiritual because you do not have the depth and the richness of the spirit that I have. And how are we to judge someone who says that they are filled with the Spirit, that they are therefore spiritual. 
We judge them by the name of the Spirit. Holy Spirit. The question is not, are you jolly and happy and falling backwards and barking like a dog and singing and laughing and so on? That is not spirituality. The question is, are you holy? And if you have the Holy Spirit, you must be and you will be holy. Which means, you must be and you will be devoted to God in love. And how will we be able to see this holiness? In obedience to God's commandments and in hatred for sin. In particular, hatred for your own sin. And one who is not living in obedience, who does not love sin, but rather or does not hate sin rather, but loves his sin and walks in sin and indulges his sin, cannot say, I am holy. And therefore cannot say, I am spiritual and I am filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit then is a person, a divine person, and the Holy Spirit. He is also the Spirit of Christ. And here Reformed theology makes an important distinction. There is the Holy Spirit as he exists as the third person of the Holy Trinity. And the same Holy Spirit is given to the man Jesus Christ at his exaltation to be his Spirit. And then that man Jesus Christ who is as to his person, the second person of the Trinity, pours out the Holy Spirit of Christ upon his church. And although the Spirit is eternal, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not yet the Holy Spirit of Christ. He existed in the Old Testament. He worked in the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, he prepared the world in particular, the church for Christ. He spoke of Christ in the scriptures by inspiration. He even worked in the womb of the Virgin Mary to produce, to form the human nature of Christ. But he was not yet the Holy Spirit of Christ. And when Christ came and walked upon the earth, he was not yet the Holy Spirit of Christ. He was equipped, Christ was, by the Holy Spirit to be prophet, priest, and king. He gave Christ power. He gave him power even to offer himself on the cross for our sins. But he was not yet the Holy Spirit of Christ. And that's the teaching of John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Notice, the word given is in italics in the authorized version. The Holy Ghost was not yet, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That does not mean the Holy Spirit did not yet exist, but the Holy Spirit was not yet the Spirit of Christ. And in that sense, He was not yet. Because of this truth, that the Holy Spirit was not the Holy Spirit of Christ throughout the Old Testament, this explains why the Old Testament saints did not enjoy the experience of salvation as we do today. Notice, I did not say they were not saved. They did not enjoy the experience of salvation in the rich way in which we do. They were saved, they were regenerated, they were made holy by the Spirit of God, but they were not yet indwelled by that Spirit as we are today. And only with the work of Jesus Christ
Christ in his incarnation and death and resurrection and going to the right hand of God, only then did the Holy Spirit become the Holy Spirit of Christ. Because Christ had to earn the Holy Spirit for his people, for his church. That's what John 7 means. He was not yet glorified. And he would be glorified in the way of his going to the cross and then rising from the dead, ascending into heaven, and being at the right hand of God. And only when he had done that did he have the Holy Spirit given to him to be his spirit, to work on his behalf for his church at Pentecost onward. And that's what Acts 2 teaches us. That's what the Apostle Peter already understood on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Christ has been highly exalted and he has received the gift of the Holy Ghost which was promised to him. And because of that, he now has the authority to pour out upon his church his Holy Spirit. That's the great blessing that we have as members of the New Testament Church, we have the Holy Spirit of Christ. And no mere man could ever have the authority to send the Holy Spirit. And yet, Jesus tells us that He will send the Holy Spirit. That's John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And the Holy Spirit will never be sent by a mere man, because, as we have said, he is God himself. And the Holy Spirit will not glorify a mere man. But he will and he does glorify Christ who is God incarnate. Because the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of Christ, he never works independently of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit never does to speak colloquially his own thing. The Holy Spirit has no independent ministry in the church separate from Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit works on behalf of and only on behalf of Jesus Christ. That's what he himself says in verse 13 of chapter 16. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. He shall not speak of himself. Therefore, a